next time you jump into a yacht, you should worry not about the wind, but about waves. An average storm can't cause enough damage on its own, as the wind is unlikely to tilt the boat over. A wind-driven wave, however, might destroy a lot of equipment and even sink the yacht altogether. Don't worry though, it's not that common to come across a bad storm, or worse, a hurricane while at sea. You'd really have to be looking for it. Most people with over 20 years worth of experience at sea have never encountered extreme weather. Sure, the word yacht can sound a bit luxurious, but in some parts of the world, it's not that expensive. Like in Northern Europe, for example, you can purchase a ready-to-sail ship for around ten to $20,000. It might need a bit of fixing, but it won't be a bad investment. If you do plan on sailing to Europe, you might want to skip the Mediterranean, since it's a pretty lousy region for sailing. You'll either have too much wind or no wind at all, which is the worst kind of weather for sailors. The perfect conditions are created by relatively strong and steady winds. You'll find those in the Caribbean. And don't worry about the size of your ship. It's really not that important you'll just need to be well prepared. You can really travel around the world in a 30-foot long yacht if you're brave enough. In fact, one of the smallest boats to ever sail around the world was just 21 feet. Alessandro Di Benedetto circumnavigated the world in his little sailboat. It took him 268 days and 19 hours. What's even more impressive is that his boat was nearly destroyed near Cape Horn but he managed to fix it and get back to France to win the world record. Planning on breaking world records yourself? Make sure you sail around the world eastward. It's easier, mostly due to stronger and more predictable winds and eastward currents in the southern hemisphere. Only five existing world records were obtained when travelers used the westward route. And since 2010, no one has set a record while going in that direction. There's no need to start learning astronavigation. Nobody uses it these days. It's more of a nice to have. Experienced sailors don't rely on space bodies to orient themselves. What people do use now for recreational navigation is an iPad. Even Airbus and Boeing pilots use iPads when flying. Speaking of how prepared you should be, brace yourself for a lot of boredom. We've all heard stories about wonderful sunrises and sunsets, swimming with dolphins and tuna. But you might have nothing to do for weeks. You'll just need to fix the tack every now and then, and that's it. As for the remaining 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 30 seconds of the day, no tasks. Bring a board game or a lot of books, will you? You might not be able to catch up with your friends back at home either. The internet at sea is both really slow and expensive. Slow as in it's going to take about a half an hour to download a small picture. Expensive as in a gigabyte might cost up to several thousand dollars. It's also best if you leave your pets at home. Dogs in particular don't like it at sea too much. Especially large dogs or those who weren't accustomed to that environment early on in their lives. You won't be able to easily toilet train a dog on board either. Cats, on the other hand, are a lot easier to take care of, so they make better sailors. Don't go heavy on the bananas if you're heading for the ocean either, as they're seen as bad luck, especially on fishing boats. Some sailors say fish won't bite a hook if bananas are somewhere on board. Cats are, again, absolutely okay to take on a boat since they're thought to be a sign of good luck. It probably has more to do with the fact that they keep rats away. Let's say you want to cross the ocean. Will there be any stops on the way? If not, you won't want to. Sure, you can stop in the middle of the ocean and take a break, but why would you want that? There aren't a lot of islands when you cross the oceans, and it takes weeks to go from one piece of land to another. No matter where your yacht is, it has to obey the laws of its country of registration. As such, you have to make sure that everything you bring on board complies with your national law. Plus, you have to register everything you have when crossing sea borders. If Antarctica is on your must-see list, you must know that you might not get there on a non-metallic boat. The hull must be made of either steel or aluminum to withstand harsh weather conditions. 
You might find birds in the ocean. They don't just pass by, but actually live there. Most of them choose to sit on deck to rest when they see a boat. That's because they may have been in continuous flight for months at a time. If you're not planning on cleaning up after them, it's best you don't allow them to land on your boat. It depends on how bored you'll get, I guess. On the fun side, there are a lot of small islands you can only check out by boat. They are otherwise off-limits to tourists. You'll be able to see exotic plants and animal species, unique landscapes and secluded villages. One knot is equal to one nautical mile per hour, or approximately 1.151 miles per hour. The best wind to handle small and mid-sized ships is anywhere between 8 to 12 knots. This is still good enough to reach impressive sailing speeds. For beginners, a speed of 5 to 8 knots is perfect to learn the basics. Anything under 5 knots is too slow. Age was only a number for Laura Decker when, at 16 years old, she became the youngest person to ever circumnavigate the world solo. The Dutch authorities almost didn't allow this to happen since they believed she was too young for the journey. This astonishing feat isn't recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records because nobody wants to encourage 14-year-olds to sail the world by themselves. The first time a person managed to circumnavigate the world alone was back in the late 1800s. Joshua Slocum left Boston, Massachusetts on April 24, 1895 and returned three years later on June 27, 1898 to Newport, Rhode Island. In total, he sailed more than 46,000 miles. The water in oceans and seas is pretty salty. While 3.5% is the average salt level, some bodies of water contain even more salt. It speeds up metal corrosion, so the saltier the sea, the more damage it will do to your ship and the faster it'll happen. The saltiest waters on Earth are in the Mediterranean Sea, which has roughly 3.8% salinity. For less salty water, head towards the poles. The fastest sailor of all time is Paul Larson from Australia. He broke the world record at 65.45 knots. His records are for the sailing speed at a distance of 0.3 miles, also called outright, and for the fastest nautical mile. No maritime story would be complete without that of Violet Jessup, the nurse that survived all three disasters aboard the sister ships the Titanic, the Britannic, and Olympic. She worked on ships to support her family well into her 60s and traveled all over the world. After finishing her voyages, she spent the rest of her life in Suffolk, England. There are no boats with an unlimited lifespan. They all have to retire at some point. After a certain time spent at sea, they are no longer considered safe or stable. Cargo ships that cross oceans, for example, typically reach 20 to 30 years of age. As for sailboats, they're meant to last 30 to 40 years at most, even if they're built with more flexible materials like plywood or fiberglass. Yo ho ho, a pirate's life for me! Let me stop you right there. If you think being a pirate or a sailor back in the old days was so cool, here's the harsh truth. It was not all about singing sea shanties and embarking on epic voyages across the seven seas to find the fountain of youth or caves filled with gold. It wasn't actually that cool being at sea all the time, and I have five compelling reasons to prove you so. Let's dive in, pun intended. Now imagine this. You're so excited. You've been waiting for this day to come, and finally, it's official. You're going to become a real sailor. The captain tells you to get ready because the next day, you're going to set sail on a journey that is expected to take somewhere around six months, if you're lucky, that is, because storms and singing mermaids could complicate things. You pack a few things. Now, let's pause this daydream for a quick second because here comes problem number one. What I mean by packing a few things is just the clothes on your back. Sailors would only have one set of clothes that they almost never washed during the entire voyage. That's because they believed that dirt and grease would protect them from winds and rains. Okay, back to the thought experiment. You kiss your family goodbye and head to the port where your new home is waiting. 
one of your crew members not so warmly welcomes you on the deck and shows you where you'll be sleeping. This makes you start doubting your choice of becoming a sailor in the first place. Because after seeing it, you're certain that this is not going to be a five-star hotel comfort level kind of experience. So, here's problem number two. The ships were absolutely crammed. Back in the day, sailors would have to accept living in such conditions, whether they were working for a big name like Christopher Columbus or not. The Nina and the Pinta were two of Columbus's ships and the best sailing vessels of their time. Yet again, this didn't change the fact that they were so small that men had no place to sleep. Which gives us problem number three. Having to sleep next to one another on a crowded deck where they could barely move was not so great for sailors' health conditions, and going below deck to escape the snoring of their fellow shipmates was not an option because there was no fresh air there. In addition, you could always come across a rat there. So, kiss personal hygiene goodbye. And in case you're wondering how rats got there, those little rascals are actually good swimmers. Also, sailors were at sea no matter the season or the weather, so they were often cold and wet, which also made it hard for them to stay healthy and strong. Speaking of health conditions brings us to problem number four, and it's food and hunger. Sailors didn't have their own mini fridges with different kinds of condiments back then, like the compartments luxury cruises have these days. So they had to come up with ways to store enough food that would last for months or even years. Due to that, their food options were limited. It definitely wasn't like the food prepared by Michelin star chefs. One of the most common food options on ships was salted meat, which wasn't as chewy as you might imagine. Or a biscuit called hardtack, also called sheet iron or worm castles. And there's a reason for all these creative nicknames. Hardtack was essentially a mix of water and flour baked into a cardboard flavored cracker. They were brick-like and the only way they could be eaten was if they were softened with water. If only sailors could dip them in their afternoon tea, right? Sometimes these biscuits would still be extremely dense. Then sailors would have to slam their fists down on them to break them into smaller pieces to be able to eat the stuff. As long as hardtack was kept dry, it rarely got spoiled. The sailors would be able to eat them after a year if they had any left. But most of the time, it would be extremely hard to keep them dry inside wooden casks. And then, they would get infested with bugs that would leave small holes behind. However, sailors would still eat them anyway. Have to take protein from somewhere. By now, you might have figured out that there were no fruits or vegetables in a sailor's diet. This caused vitamin deficiency in many sailors. So those toothless pirates and sailors in the movies you see? Yep, it's all because of poor nutrition. And the iron hard crackers probably didn't help either. But when sailors ran out of food, not having a balanced diet was probably the least of their concerns. Back in the old times, a voyage could take way longer than expected due to weather conditions. There could be no winds to push the ship further or a powerful storm could shake the ship and the waves and water could destroy the food storage. So when such a situation happened, sailors could easily run out of food. Well, they could throw the net into the ocean and catch some fish, right? But sailors didn't eat fish even in the face of starvation. Many captains mentioned this in their logbooks, which were basically captain's diaries. The problem was not that sailors couldn't get fish. In fact, many different kinds of fish were caught in their nets, but they had to throw them all back into the sea. During the exploration era, Antonio Pigafetta mentioned in his logbook that the ship's crew caught an unbelievable amount of fish, but they didn't eat any of them. Also, in the same journal, he mentioned that 40 of the sailors lost their lives. Naturally, sailors thought that only poisonous fish were dangerous. And because of that, they were inclined to eat only the fish they knew. But even a well-cooked tuna could be poisonous, and they had to learn it the hard way. But it's not like they didn't have any methods to check fish. Spanish sailors, for example, put silver coins on them. If the silver changed color, they considered those fish to be poisonous, therefore inedible. So they would toss them overboard. Other sailors would place the fish they caught on the deck and observe if flies or other insects came to feast on it. 
If they didn't land on the fish, this meant that it was poisonous. But if insects did come, they considered it safe to eat. The problem of eating fish caught in the open sea dates back to as early as the 7th century BCE. Imperial healers in ancient China knew that eating fish was the reason why some sailors lost their lives. But they couldn't prove that the fish were poisonous, and the mystery remained unsolved up until the 19th century. In 1886, a Cuban doctor finally figured out that some fish contained poison in their tissues and muscles, even though they were considered a safe-to-eat breed. That kind of poison is actually something that is found in plankton. Some fish can eat this plankton without being affected. They store it in their bodies. And as they grow, the rate of the poison increases within them. And this is something that doesn't go away no matter how long one cooks the fish. If you still think that life at sea back in the old days sounds exciting, this fifth problem will convince you otherwise. Let's say you've managed to get along with your roommates, stay clean and healthy, and eat regularly. But there's always a risk of getting caught by pirates, and they didn't ask for things kindly. So, if you didn't want to end up as food for sharks, you would have to raise the white flag and simply join them. Not the career you are planning, right? Good luck scrubbing the deck for the rest of your life. So in 2017, over 25 million people boarded cruise ships all over the world. Now, if you're keeping count, that's more than the total population of Greece. It's become America's favorite choice when it comes to going on vacation. It's easy to see why hopping aboard a cruise ship becomes more popular each year. Heading out on a cruise is also coming back in style with newer generations. Two-thirds of Gen Y and Millennials say that cruising is their new preferred type of vacation. How's that? Well, let's see. It's easy to plan in advance. On board, you can find activities for all family members, and you get a chance to visit several different destinations in one trip. An added bonus of booking a cruise? You can sample various places for a future time off. The entertainment on board is often top-notch, providing passengers with an added taste of luxury. And the amenities and accommodations are generally very reliable. Not to mention that it gives tourists that feeling of actually getting away from everything that people strive for while out of the office. Royal Caribbean International is one of the largest cruise lines in the world, with just over 19% of the cruise market as of 2018. Its current fleet is divided into many different classes of ships, including the Voyager class, Radiance, and Quantum. Ooh. The latest addition to the Royal Caribbean International's impressive fleet was built in 2018. Wonder of the Seas is now the largest cruise ship in the world. Since this spectacular liner has just had her maiden voyage in March 2022, let's look at some of the incredible perks it has to offer its passengers. For starters, the boat is so big that it had to be split into neighborhoods. Well, it figures since Wonder of the Seas can accommodate almost 7,000 passengers. Fond of New York? Well, no worries. Wonder of the Seas has a central park of its own, with an estimated 10,000 plants to check out. The ship's central park is a feature of all Oasis-class ships, being one of the so-called neighborhoods. Let's look at some other areas, shall we? Like this boardwalk, a place that includes an arcade, a candy store, and a sports bar. It's best suited for long walks. There's a pool and sports zone on Wonder of the Sea. These areas feature the ship's numerous pools and hot tubs. There are many activities to check out on the sports court. Then there's the Royal Promenade, or Promenade if you prefer. That's the main road on Wonder of the Seas, with bars, lounges, and places to grab a cup of coffee, or a luxurious latte. The entertainment neighborhood is the focal point for leisure activities on the ship. Here, guests can find a comedy club, an ice skating rink, and even a theater. The spa and fitness area is a tranquil zone with a huge array of treatments available. The fitness center is free of charge, by the way, so there's no excuse for guests to skip a leg day. 
An extra eighth zone was added to Wonder of the Seas. It's called the Suite Neighborhood. This is an exclusive area designed for guests staying in the suites. Oh, now I get it. It's located at the top of the ship. Guests here have designated staff members called Royal Genies. Yeah, if you rub a lamp in your suite, they appear. Nah, not really. The genies are similar to butlers. They can cater to just a few cabins. Of course, the cruise line wants to divert other guests from asking these crew members various questions and taking their time. That's why the genies don't wear name tags in public areas. As for its itinerary, Wonder of the Seas was initially supposed to be homeported in China. But Royal Caribbean decided to move the liner to the United States. In March 2022, the ship started its journey with seven-night Eastern and Western Caribbean itineraries. In May 2022, Wonder of the Seas is scheduled for a trip to Europe, with Western Mediterranean cruises from Barcelona and Rome planned for its guests. Passengers will also be able to visit Palma de Mallorca, Spain, and Capri, Italy. When the summer season is over, Wonder of the Seas is scheduled to return to Florida to offer year-round sailing starting November 2022. And by the way, there is no truth to the rumor that a special cruise only for highly allergic and hay fever sufferers will be called the Wonder of the Sneeze. Nope, not at all. Now, it's hard to imagine a ship so massive that can accommodate so many amenities on board. For example, the Titanic was the largest ship of its time, measuring 882 feet in length. And Wonder of the Seas is not only 1188 feet long, it's also 36% taller and 34% wider. Speaking of lifeboats, which I am about to, Titanic had a mere 20 lifeboats on board which was tragically not enough to fit all the passengers after the ship hit the iceberg. But Wonder of the Seas has an even smaller number of lifeboats, 18 to be precise. Sounds weird and dangerous? Well, not really, given that each of these lifeboats can accommodate up to 370 people. It means that all the passengers and crew members, an estimated 8,000 people if fully booked, are going to be safe in case of an emergency. If we could somehow have a race between the two ships, well, Titanic was in fact the faster ship out of the two, beating Wonder of the Seas by one knot per hour. Cruise ship passengers today are more interested in the experience rather than the speed of the boat itself. That's why how fast a ship can travel is not an extremely important aspect nowadays. In terms of costs, Titanic cost around $7.5 million at the time of its construction. It's the equivalent of about $200 million today. How about Wonder of the Seas? Well, it cost a staggering $1.35 billion to build, making it six times more expensive than the Titanic. How about we compare ticket prices? Well, in this case, the least expensive ticket on Titanic was £7. It's about $1,000 today. The cheapest ticket on Wonder of the Seas is currently 423 bucks, but prices may vary depending on the location, season, itinerary, and how much you tip your royal genie. And I know you were going to ask, how about icebergs? Well, Titanic steamed in the frigid North Atlantic, where you had to be on the lookout for those. Wonder of the Seas will be cruising the balmy Caribbean, where the worst thing you can hit on is 17 in blackjack. Oops, busted. Anyway, set side by side with its other sisters from the Royal Caribbean fleet, Wonder of the Seas is equally as impressive. The company's earliest ships could host about 2,500 people. This included passengers and the staff. Such ships were Splendor of the Seas, Legend of the Seas, and the smallest of them all, Thumbelina of the Seas. No, wait, that should be Empress of the Seas. Oops, my bad. The largest ships in the company's fleet can now house about 9,000 people altogether. That's almost three times the size and capacity of the earlier liners. Wonder of the Seas is one of them, as well as Harmony of the Seas and Symphony of the Seas. Are you seeing a pattern here? Yep, if you ever encounter a ship with Of the Seas in its name, it's safe to assume it belongs to Royal Caribbean. 
But if it's a can of tuna, it might actually be chicken of the sea. Hey, I like tuna! Now, choosing between cruise ships based on their size is like wondering if you should visit your local museum or the Louvre in Paris. It all depends on your preferences. Some families prefer small settings. Others are a fan of large spaces that can provide everything they need. Historically, it's equally as exciting how far we've come in terms of maritime transportation. The SS Royal William, for example, was the first boat to ever make a transatlantic voyage almost entirely steam-powered in 1833. And it was a mere 160 feet long and could house roughly 155 passengers. And if the seas were calm, then they were housed less roughly. <laughs> Similarly, the first modern megaship in the world was the MS Sovereign of the Seas. Launched in 1987, it was only 888 feet long and could carry a little under 3,000 passengers. Size and capacity are not the single improvements added to newer cruise ships out there. Recent technological developments in artificial intelligence and facial recognition have allowed cruise operators to ensure faster, smoother boarding for passengers. If, in the past, it took from 60 to 90 minutes for all passengers to board a ship, nowadays, cruise ship operators manage to get people comfortably settled in less than 15 minutes. Now, I'm sure you're already eager to book a ticket, but let's look into some of the more interesting activities you can try on board Wonder of the Seas. This way, you'll know what you're getting yourself into. All Royal Caribbean ships have loads of artworks available for their guests to enjoy. But Wonder of the Seas goes above and beyond, even featuring statues of astronauts in key locations around the ship. You'll find the first astronaut looking through the glass at the promenade, while a second one is busy rock climbing at the boardwalk. The third and last astronaut is more of a movie fan. This statue can be found near the movie screen sitting area. Going astronaut sightseeing is proving to be quite the experience among guests. In the areas with no access to sunlight, Wonder of the Seas features virtual balconies. In case of bad weather, guests can still have a feeling of the outdoors, but without having to hide from wind or rain. Teenagers have a place of their own reserved on the ship. There's a special club with a private hot tub, selfie area, games, and comfortable seating. The inside part of this club features a vending machine, an interesting collection of literature, and tables for foosball. Well, sign me up! <laughs>